Hello, and this presentation is called Game Theory. What is it good for? And this is a repetition of an earlier presentation uh, with a slight twist. So we'll recall that ha Hamilton's altruism model was a two-agent model with just blue and orange. And in altruism, the blue agent benefits orange, and as a result, blue is harmed. Now, the difference a game theory makes, again, is that it lets us model social interaction. And this is where the outcome depends on what more than one player does. It isn't just what one agent does that determines the kind of relationship. It's what everyone involved does. So what if the actions depend not simply on what blue does, but on what orange does in response? What if we can't determine whether an act is altruistic from the acts of one agent alone? We have to look at it in the context of interactions. And this is what game theory is about. Now, one of the most famous games is the Prisoner's Dilemma, which is actually a mathematical model, and it's probably the oldest and most worked on model, and that's because it has a rather frustrating outcome. And as Herb Gintis notes, an economist, game theory is notationally challenged, and getting a handle on uh, the game often requires putting it into the framework of something more familiar and working through it a while, just as we learn games uh, when we play them. So we're going to take a card game approach and just have two players. So this is the simplest possible card game. And there's only two options to each player. Player A can play or hold, and player B can play or hold. And that means that there's four possible outcomes. If both players play, they both earn five points. But if player A plays and player B holds, then A gets zero points and B gets eight. If player A holds and player B plays, then A comes up with eight points and B gets zero. And if they both hold their card, they both get one. So this is uh, the prisoner's dilemma, and that's not because of the way that I'm telling the story. It's because of the way that the strategies are related to one another and the point values. So let's play a hand here to learn this. In the first round here, player B plays their card, and so does player A. And voila, they both get five points. So that's one of the outcomes. Let's do a second one and explore another outcome. In so this time, player B plays, but player A holds. As a result, A gets eight points and B gets zero. A is now ahead in the game. Let's play a third hand. This time, B holds and A holds as well. Now they both get just one point. A is still ahead, but they're kind of closing in on each other. So in the next round, A chooses to play, and B responds by holding again. And now A gets zero points, and B gets eight, and they've drawn to a, a stalemate. And if they're thinking about this, and this is the idea behind this uh, model, is that both players know the options that are open to the other player and what the payoffs are. They don't know what the other player will do, but they know what options the other player has, and they're exactly the same as their own options. So if they both play, A will get five points. But if A holds the card while B plays, A gets eight points. And this means that when A is thinking rationally about what to do, A should just think, I should hold. Because when player A plays, I'll earn eight points, and eight is a greater number than five. The other option open to B is to hold. And if player A plays his card and B holds, then A will get zero points. 
But if A holds the card, A will get one point. And again, when player A is thinking about this, the obvious conclusion is to hold the card because one is greater than zero. So from A's perspective, knowing the options that are open to B, whatever B decides to do, A should just hold their card. And that is what the prisoner's dilemma predicts that player A will do. So blue, the blue player, player A, should always hold their card. What should orange do? Well, orange is in the same situation. Orange knows the options that are open to A and that they're the same as her own options. So if they both play, B will get five points. But if, when A plays, B holds their card, B will get eight points. So what should B do? Well, B should hold the card because the number eight is greater than the number five. Similarly, if player B plays their card and A holds, B will get zero points. But if they both hold, B will get one point. So what should B do? Well, zero is less than one. So again, player B should hold the card. So thinking this through, we find that Orange should always hold her cards as well. And this produces what's called a Nash Equilibrium. And the Nash Equilibrium is when all players are simultaneously making their best reply to the strategy choices of others. There is a Nash Equilibrium in the Prisoner's Dilemma and in this game. So this is a quote from Ken Benmore's little book called Game Theory, a very short introduction. And there's a nice photo of Ken Benmore. So what is the Nash Equilibrium in the Prisoner's Dilemma? Well, both parties should defect. Uh, they should always hold their card. They should always refuse to cooperate. So the Prisoner's Dilemma the way that the game is set up, it loads the dice against cooperating. And as Benmore observes, rational players don't cooperate in the prisoner's dilemma because the conditions necessary for cooperating don't exist. So the story gets in the way of seeing the way that the logic of the math works. Uh, over and over, when students tell the story of the prisoner's dilemma, they conclude that they should cooperate with one another. But in fact, the Nash equilibrium here is to not cooperate. In our example, to always hold the card. And yet, we know, as we showed the last time we did this, that if both players always hold their card, they will only earn one point per round. And if they both play, they will each earn five points per round. And if we were to put this in a larger context, so that there's more than one pair of players who are competing. So here we have blue and orange, and they're always holding the card and not cooperating. And over here we have purple and brown, and they're always playing their card. Well, then at each round of the game, blue and orange are going to each earn one point, whereas purple and brown are going to earn five points. And again, if we imagine those points are offspring, it's easy to see that the cooperative pair is going to have higher reproductive success. But in terms of the prisoner's dilemma, if they're thinking in terms of their own self-interest and knowing that the other person is going to do the same thing, the game should always land in the defect corner. So how can we achieve cooperation the Prisoner's Dilemma helps us see that this is a real challenge, and we'll explore this more in presentations uh, to come. Thank you for listening.